Ergo. Hey, hey. What's up? This is Ergo. Absolutely yeah, true. I'm Kiss. I'm Damon. And what we do here is reshape culture for the more liberatory and creative. And we have a special guest with us, somebody who has contributed and sacrificed and shown up for movement in so many ways over the last decade. Movement lawyer and professor, Sheila Betty. Yeah, we've been wanting to talk to Sheila for a while, but part of what kind of lit the fire for us to talk now is we had this conversation right before the DNC uh, convened here in Chicago in August of 2024. And so we figured it might be a good time to get a little complimentary legal advice. Um, But we talk beyond that so much more about what does it look like to wield those tools in support of both activists and organizers who get pulled into the legal system, as well as the family members of folks who have experienced the worst of the violence caused by policing and prisons. We say it a bunch of times in the conversation, but I am super grateful for Sheila's work and her cohort of radical and liberatory lawyers and for folks who are like looking to figure out what their space is and maybe you don't see yourself as a frontline activist, go to law school. Go ahead and get that get that degree, get that little license, whatever it is they call it. It feels like it's a bunch of tests, but Sheila shows that it is really a contribution that's invaluable to movement space. Plus, your mother will be so proud. <laughs> All right, I ain't so. doing it. <laughs> All right, with that, let's hop into it with the one and only Sheila. Let's get it. It is my honor and pleasure. I am excited and overjoyed to welcome in friend of the show, but also someone who I admire and appreciate for their diligence, their dedication, their sacrifice and commitment to movement in so many people's lives. We have the one, the only, Sheila Betty's with us. (laughs) David, that was so beautiful. You are such a beautiful spirit. You are going to be gassed up throughout the conversation. So prepare yourself. I'm just very grateful for your time and all that you do. Let's get started. How we always do. Two-part questions centered around time. Define time however you will. That could be this day, this hour, this season, this lifetime. In this time, how is the world treating you and how are you treating the world, Sheila Betty? I love this question. And I know so many people have said this, right? You feel like you're going to, I'm going to have this great answer prepared. And now everything I thought of has fallen out of my, out of my brain. It's like that sometimes. (sighs) Yeah. So there's this writer that I love, Isabel Allende, who writes these, um, Chilean writer who writes sort of like political romance novels. And she talks about what a privilege it is to have a purpose for your anger. And I'm feeling that so much like right now, how, how much I feel like it is such a privilege to do the work and to have a place to put, you know, the anger and compassion and love, but, but also like a lot of the anger right now. Um, So I would say, I feel like that is, I feel incredibly lucky to be able to be in that, in that place. And, you know, it's summertime in Chicago and my family is all healthy. So I, I, I'm feeling, you know, I feel like there's this constant flux between, you know, being able to enjoy, you know, the, the beautiful things in life and then also kind of being in this moment of real struggle and, you know, constant anger. Uh, and, and one of the things that I feel like at the end of the day gives me comfort is like I have a place to put it. I have a, I have a container for it. That's mostly productive. I want to talk about that container. Uh, but before, I mean, I guess you can name what the container is in, in this, if that feels right. But that relationship to anger, I think, is not something that often uh, we spend a lot of time talking and thinking about, right? There's like this idea of righteous anger. There's, you know, the pros and cons of outrage as a motivator in movement. But I'm curious for you how your relationship to anger lives in you through the work? Like you say, you found this container for it. How comfortable are you with it? How does it show up for you? How has that evolved? It's a really big question. I mean, I think anger is so many things, right? I mean, it's sort of outrage at injustice. It's it's frustration. It also is, I mean, the kind of anger that I'm talking about, it's also, you know, deep love for, for the people that I'm in community with. And I think that it's it's not okay to become numb to all of the like horror that's happening in the world. 
and that to be able to hold that anger and to be able to say it's a motivating force and I'm going to, you know, put it in action and the action, you know, is, is hopefully guided by love. That's the way I've been able to think about it. But I mean, I tell, you know, so often I have conversations with my students and they'll be, for example, like the horrific, horrific murder of Dexter Reed that happened in Chicago this spring. And um, my students were sort of saying, you know, how can you keep on doing this, right? How can you, you know, how can you go in and watch the video with the family, you know, over and over again? The horror of it feels like the first time. Right. You, you don't you don't in the minute the day that I would ever become numb, which I can't imagine is like the day I need to not do the work. And so it so I you know, I think it's feeling it all right, feeling it all and then recognizing that I have this skill set that I can put to use to try to to stop or at the very, very least repair some of the harm. Oh, that's such a poignant place to locate that feeling in. And yeah, was was present around the spring as the Dexter Reed video became released to the public. And I think that's that's a, a, a really good entry point into understanding your work in this very valuable, dis- distinct space that is like movement lawyering, movement law, right? Because there's a lot of legal and lawyer folks that come around things that movement has to engage but for you as a person who is in allegiance or adheres to these principles of this like radical love facing community that's also resisting state violence, there's just a different ethic that I recognize uh, that I'm sure is probably hard to like try to have to prove, <laughs> you know, that like I'm not one of those downtown suits, like I'm coming here with resources and with skill, and with accreditation, but from a different grounding. And so I want to go into like the human aspect of a moment like that, right? Because you have to watch the the video. You have to get all the evidence. You have to prepare the arguments. You have to prepare the messaging. You have to do all these coordinating with people who have questions. But then you're also meeting this family through the prism of the most horrific tragedy and trauma anyone could ever imagine. How do you carry yourself and move through that interaction of meeting, of gaining trust, or of maybe not being trusted yet, but having to do this service that is so particular, so fine, and everyone does not have access to be able to support in that way? It's such a good question. Before I answer it, Damon, I want to, do you remember like the the first time we met? Your downtown suits question made me think of this. I can't place it right now. Please, please remind me. So um, it was during the uh, Freedom Square, the Home and Square. Okay, um, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yes. And I, uh, so I mean, my my son was, I mean, he must have been like five or six at the time. Um, we had been, I'd been in actions before and done some legal observing, but I don't know even know if we had had a conversation. And I really, really, really wanted to support, but was just feeling, you know, overwhelmed by life. And then one day, court got out early. And um, I was like, I'm going to go and I'm going to go, you know, bring some food before my next meeting. So I get out of court in my suit. In those days, I was wearing high heels and I get two dozen donuts from Dunkin Donuts um, right across from the courthouse. And so I walk up, you know, like in my suit, in my heels and you come out to meet me and um, we're like donuts, you know, thanks. Uh, And then you ask me a couple of questions. You know, I told you I was like a civil rights lawyer. I was working at Northwestern and you were incredibly polite, not your warm self, but you were really polite. (laughs) (laughs) And then I am thinking like, I want to support, I need to be efficient. I don't have a lot of time. So I say to you, I would love to door dash you guys a pizzas like a couple times a week. Can I get like the cell phone number of someone who I could set up to do that? And you say, you know, we're like really hoping to have organic and fresh food for people. Um, that's like really generous <laughs> that's, of you. That's funny because I eat pizza every day. It's like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like walking back to the car and I'm thinking, first of all, I'm like, I, you know, I was so thoughtless. Of course, this occupation that's trying to, you know, be the world that we need if we're not going to have prisons is going to want to have healthy food for people. Like I'm so thoughtless. And then I was like, oh, wait a second. Damon thinks I'm a fed. <laughs> Damon thinks I'm a fad. That's why he doesn't want to like give me a cell phone number or tell me how late people are going to be there to collect. Like he thinks I'm a fad. And he says, so I um, does that does that ring a bell? At no, all? it does not. My to be honest, my it's probably not a good thing. Like my memory of day to day Freedom Square has gotten so 
warmed, like warped and swamped that like I love hearing these stories back because it's hard for me to place them specifically. So I'm glad I was at least polite. And in retrospect, I would have wanted some pizza. That's somebody that said that. <laughs> I probably said that begrudgingly. That's probably why I wasn't warm because I had to not accept the offer of pizza to be alive with the community values. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know if the world we're trying to build doesn't have pizza. I think that's that's an absurd claim. That's a way to not make yeah. your movement popular. Yeah, I, I'm shocked at myself hearing the story back. <laughs> but that's so sweet. That's so. But it also shows you like, and I'm, I'm sorry I made you feel like a fan. That's also. <laughs> There's so much from that story. And I mean, yeah, the world we're trying to build has pizza and also, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. But also, you know, I was I was um, wanting to support and, you know, perhaps not being as thoughtful as I could. And also at that moment, we didn't have the relationship that we have now. So I think it like says kind of the the trust building piece is, is really. That must have been week one after where there was a lot of like meetings and feedback. But by like week three or four, we was all eating Taco Bell and chicken and pizza anyway. So. <laughs> but it does speak to what the experience of being in a moment of like heightened precarity through action, how that informs how you communicate. Because the way you describe that, like polite, but not as warm and like healthy skepticism, I think is a really important muscle <laughs> to have. Um, it's funny. You brought that up this week ish is the like eighth anniversary all my like damon always makes fun of me because i'm still on facebook but all my like facebook memories are like videos from the first week of it um so i've been watching and downloading and archiving those and it's been bringing me back to that like the unsuredness of being in public in a space knowing that the state could be coming from any direction at any time and that you need support and so I'm curious whether it's, you know, obviously not every moment is heightened in that exact way, but I'm curious how you now approach people in a, maybe a different way. And it goes to what Damon was saying. How do you prepare your body, your voice, your approach to s signal and as much as you can, like, hey, I'm here because I care about you? You know, I don't take for granted that people have to trust me with the, the like worst possible moments of their life and that that's something I have to earn, right? I'm not entitled to it. And I think part of it is, is showing up, you know, as a, as a full human and showing up as a full human who has a certain set of skills that's a trade, just like any other trade. And I'm, you know, I, I feel like it's an honor to put that trade to work and to create platforms for people to uh, both tell their stories and to demand, you know, some small semblance of of justice from the from the state. But at a baseline, it's about connecting on the the shared humanity and you know recognizing that that act of trusting someone else to tell your story. I mean, you all know this, right? As the work that you do, it's in some ways it's very similar. You cannot take for granted, you know, what it what it means for someone else to trust you with their with their words and their their life experience. And some people uh, sort of, you know, like I represent GKMC, the youth group, and, you know, they, you know, are complete abolitionists, have this beautiful vision, see the law as a tool, want to know what's happening, but, and, you know, authorize different legal strategies, but sort of feel like, yeah, go do that lawyer shit and let us know how it's helping to build our power. Then there are families of people who, you know, are murdered by the police and, it is so important that the entire litigation process is grounded in both their experience, their pain, you know, what they need, because the litigation process in and of itself is re-traumatizing. It, you know, it is set up to be re-traumatizing, and it is set up to give every advantage to the state that does so much harm. And so I think the other thing is speaking really honestly about the process, making sure that when people engage in it, they know that... It is a process that can build power and bring some healing, but it takes some real intentionality. And it also takes a lot of trust um, between lawyers and, and the folks that are trying to challenge the system. Where is your space for actual like reflection and analysis? Because I think an ethic aligned movement lawyer has a purview that almost no one else can get to in the sense that you have both a very intricate understanding of 
the power building and resistance movements of liberatory organizing through helping to push through a legislation, through being there when folks are attacked, to you know knowing when the protest is happening, knowing when the rally is happening, observing, but then also this intimate and face-to-face understanding of state violence and of the harm. Uh, you know, having to know every millisecond of the video, having to know each officer's name and their history, right? Like in a way that even most folks who are protesting or who are organizing or who name themselves as abolitionists don't have that level of detail. And so for you, I see you and I hear you naming, like always showing up in this space of service and a family needs me, an organization, an organizer needs me, and I show up and do that. Do you get your space to actually sit back and reflect on analysis, on system building, on the future that you want to see, on abolition, on, you know, do you get the time to actually analyze and reflect? Not as much as I should. But, you know, I I also, I mean, I see the work. I mean, sometimes maybe it's it's of service, but I mean, I see the work as a collaboration and building the world that I want, that I need to keep my family safe, you know, that is going to be better for 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 my kids. So, I mean, I see it as a as as a real collaboration and I see it as a great source of joy most of the time. Right. Um, and again, the place where I can I can put my anger, right, the, the fact, you know, that I can tell Dexter Reed's story and he's not just some black man on the west side of Chicago targeted by the CPD. He is a whole person who played basketball and loved to cook, helped his mom make healthy dinners, right, was beloved. Right. And that that I can, through this lawsuit, make sure that he is that the state has to answer for that Dexter Reed. I mean, that gives me comfort. And also having to watch that video or having to watch the videos over and over again of what happened both, you know, to people who I don't know and also, you know, people who I am in deep community with and who I, who, you know, who I love, it has an effect on me. And so I do recognize that I I have to have space for my own self-care practices. And also as I've, um, you know, I think as I've gotten older, I, I really do recognize that being able to take action is such a privilege, like being able to know that there's something I can contribute in the moment. I don't lose sight of that. That's a really valuable learning that you, it also connects to what you shared before of like the having a place for, for the anger and then all the other emotions too, somewhere to pour it. And so I want to, you know, you named the first time that y'all met, but I think it could be kind of useful slash fun for y'all to just talk about what being a relationship and yeah, how, how that relationship has evolved. Because I know y'all have been so connected after the high heels on the abandoned lot, which also is very impressive that they didn't just like sink in to the dirt there. Uh, you were able to to leave. How, uh, yeah, what was, what was the next chapter? Dame, do you want to, maybe you could drive the boat a little bit here. I don't remember that exact interaction, but I remember your presence. And during Freedom Square is how I began to learn about the emergence of Westside Justice Center. It's really through, you know, seeing the collaboration in that space building as a new type of presence of law community and just, you know, being in events there, being in different programming there, that I knew that there is this like long term presence. I think. Before that moment, I knew the legal community as green hat wearing legal observers, which is like, I'm not saying disparagingly at all, like it's a very important, valuable thing, but there's also like a distance to it. And it's only in this heightened time. I think what I learned in those four years that then really culminated in your support coming out of the 2020 uprising is in addition to those high octane moments where a lot of people show up there, you and your team and your organizations embody this like diligent presence through the grueling work in between and the follow through. And so, you know, I think through time, there's like respect, you know, work through Chicago Torture Justice Center, Chicago Torture Justice Memorial. Uh, But it was really in the time, you know, years later where I was harmed, where my folks were attacked and, you know, arrested, that I saw a lot of folks show up and a lot of folks offer support and much of it was appreciated. But what you have done since with, you know, your 
consistent diligence is the word that just keeps coming up to me. It's been just greatly appreciated. I, I don't, I'm not like in a space of, of narrative. I'm in a space of feeling about it. Like I feel very comfortable, very secure when things come up for Let Us Breathe Collective. Cause as a, you know, unresourced or low resource organization that's trying to be in a lot of people's lives, a lot of complex things come on, come about that are beyond us, <laughs> you know? And so having someone to call who is so busy and doing so many important things for so many people always, responds with an immediacy and doesn't just respond, takes care, takes care of the work, but does it in a way that takes care of us. And so, yeah, there's a, uh, when shit hits the fan, like in, in some of the spaces and people are like, oh man, somebody's going to call the so-and-so on you. It's like, our lawyers ain't playing for that. Our lawyers is locked in. We play, I've been in a bunch of Zoom meetings where I've talked big shit. It was like, yeah, our lawyers got us. So don't worry about it. And I just mean you. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm, I'm saying all this to say, like, that is how I know you and see you. And I'm grateful and want to thank you for, for that work. Damn, you weren't lying when you said you were going to gas me up. I am. I am. Feel vroom, vroom. Really, um, <laughs> God, really very, very emotional. Very, very beautiful to be to be seen that way. And, you know, it's also, I think, a testament to movement in Chicago and the the the, the sort of possibilities that that you have been a part of, you know, that, that, that Jennifer has led. Again, it just feels like to be able to take this trade that I have to help support and to build the power that movement has to create this world that we all want to live in feels like I'm walking in my purpose. And, you know, the thing that I also think you hit on is that the real work of movement lawyering is not anchoring a press conference. It is being there when the shit hits the fan and totally behind the scenes and saying, you know, how can we just, you know, ensure that there's no like fake legal threats that are going to shut this down or get in the way of the real work. And, you know, that is in some ways the work that I, I feel like is is most important. It's beautiful the way you name like the connections and the movement that's been built here in Chicago specifically makes possible in that type of deep relationship. I know that the many years unfolding of legal process coming out of 2020 uprising has functioned a little bit differently here in ways that actually may inform stuff that's happening right now, which is where I, I want to get to. So is there anything, it can be as as broad as you might want, but like how has the state's legal response to the 2020 uprising over the last four years been different in Chicago than from other places? You know, Chicago is the only major city that hasn't yet settled uh, the cases that arose out of the 2020 uprisings. And, you know, these are cases where police officers were caught on video violating every CPD policy, beating people on the ground with batons, and the liability is clear. And this is these, of course, 2020 wasn't isolated, right? 2020 is part of an over 100 year history of CPD quelling protests, particularly targeting black and brown leaders, violating the First Amendment when any real movement challenging the status quo rises up. I mean, this is sort of CPD being CPD. So the intransience that CPD has had, you know, in, in, in the face of this litigation has been. It's a great word. Thank you. I, I was it's, it's actually too. one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Transients is one of my favorites. But so it's like one of these things where, where, you know, it is outrageous and also water is wet. We started off filing these cases and it was a it was a big group. People's Law Office, Joey Mogul's on the team, lawyers from the MacArthur Justice Center are on the team. And we filed one lawsuit with uh, 60 people who'd been harmed during 2020. And we pulled um, together, did uh, some Zoom meetings because, you know, this is still the COVID is, you know, COVID precautions are still very, were very much in place and made a collective decision that everybody wanted to keep their cases together in one lawsuit to require the city to respond to the movement as a whole. And, you know, in doing so, people uh, like Miracle Boyd, who has, um, you know, who had her teeth punched out by an officer who has, you know, significant money damages, were involved in a, in a lawsuit with somebody who was pushed down by an officer who has harm, but not the same kind of serious physical harm that some of the other people involved to. But the idea was that by everybody, you know, being together in a collective in this lawsuit, uh, it would force the city to confront the power of movement. And what the city did was engage in a couple of legal maneuvers that broke those lawsuits up. And so now we went from one case with 60 individuals to um, about 16 different cases, some of which have, have settled, 
based on the location and date of the of the protest. And just there, like in that telling of how in breaking up the cases, it's prolonged the litigation strategy. It has created significant barriers um, for the plaintiffs. It's like doubled the workload of the of the attorneys who are trying to push the case. There's like such an analogy there about the power of collective and what happens when you know when the when the collective gets um, gets dissipated. Like at this moment where we're still litigating those cases and we're also trying to prepare for the DNC and what we are expecting to happen in the DNC, it just feels like some sort of like groundhog day or or or, or something that, you know, we're never going to escape it. Yeah, don't put this on the groundhogs. They're just doing their thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, I've never seen that movie. I sort of know what it means and I use it, but you know, yeah, that I, there... actually was a little, a little loose use of groundhog day. Was it? Okay, it. Yeah. all right. I'm I don't just know what the, right the representative is. and litigator for the groundhogs. <laughs> the groundhogs, yeah, that will not justice stand. for the groundhogs. Justice <laughs> yeah, exactly. for the groundhogs. <laughs> So with that, maybe we could talk a little bit about the current moment. You know, we've wanted to have you on for a long time, but part of the impetus for doing this now was I think there is this kind of collective battening down the hatches slash preparing for some knowns and some unknowns in the different ways that people will be involved. Are there just like general best practices for people engaging in direct action, organizing, what have you learned about the preparations of the state that people should know heading into this time? Another very good question. And in some ways, there's a group of lawyers who've been brainstorming around, you know, how can we support movement in this time? And I keep on coming back to the idea that we can't go into court and get an injunction that's going to tell the Chicago Police Department to stop being the Chicago Police Department. We can't do that. And in some ways, I feel like like that's the only thing that would give me comfort, right? That is the only thing that would give me give me you know personally comfort as we're as we're looking towards the DNC. One of the things that we've been working on is that the big keystone policy change that CPD made in anticipation of the DNC is a new, a coordinated mass arrest policy or coordinated multiple arrest policy is what CPD calls it. Coordinated multiple arrest policy. What that is is a mass arrest policy. Right, a policy that authorizes the situations where CPD can go in and round up people, arrest them, and essentially stop the protest. There's so many levels where that raises red flags. We know that there are going to be thousands of people protesting. And the key policy response is not retraining about the unlawful use of batons, uh, limiting the use of OC or pepper spray. Uh, recognizing that police officers have to be able to withstand being told, you know, fuck 12 and not respond with with violence. That, those are not the, the, the sort of focus of CPD in preparing for the DNC. Instead, it's this policy that authorizes CPD to go in, hands-on, arrest people in very large numbers. And we know that there's just the tactic of mass arrest is one that almost guarantees violence because you've got officers getting hands on, you've got people who are there speaking out against state violence. It's just a recipe for, for, for disaster. We've done some advocacy that's mitigated some of the really harmful things that were in that policy, but there's still a coordinated mass arrest policy. And that is still the main change that CPD has done leading up to the to the to the DNC. So uh, I've got real, you know, we've have real concerns. And one of the um, one of the things that is giving me some hope is that with the help of of Joey Mogul and the Movement Law Lab, lawyers are now taking tips from organizers, and we've been organizing ourselves in terms of how we're going to be able to provide um, responses. How we've got criminal lawyers, um, lawyers that specialize in immigration, civil rights lawyers all um, collaborating, sharing information so that we can be really present for movement. And we didn't have that kind of coordination in 2020. And, and honestly, the, you know, the reason we have it is because of the, the lessons that the legal field is learning from organizers. First, I want to just clarify and just like, you know, knowledge gap for listeners. There's this new mass arrest policy. What was the policy or the expectation before? Why is that a significant delta that feels like something they already was down to do? And what does it mean to have more freedom to do that? It's not that this this policy sort of makes it easier for CPD to mass arrest. And to kind of give 
and I don't, I, I don't want to give credit. I want to, I'll just state the facts. In the policy, there are some restrictions on when a mass arrest incident can occur. So there's guidance for officers about when a mass arrest incident could occur. In the past, there was really no guidance. Um, you know, it, it was it was sort of discretionary, and the policy wasn't as as specific. The other change that the policy has from 2020 is that if you'll remember in 2020, when there were mass arrests, it was just complete complete chaos. You know, they they didn't know um, they didn't they didn't know where people were going to go. They weren't completing paperwork. The officer who was literally processing people at the station was signing the arrest reports, so you had no idea who actually arrested somebody or why they were brought in. So one of the other things that the policy does is create a more streamlined process for actually who's going to do the paperwork, when are these arrests going to occur, what's going to happen after an arrest. The issue is, why is a mass arrest policy the cornerstone of DNC preparation for CPD? Why is that the focus of the of the agency's um, time? You know, and the answer is, of course, because CPD, again, for the past however many you know, hundreds of years, has been a tool to quell protests, to quell uprising, to use state violence, particularly against um, people who are who are speaking out uh, against state violence. You know, against protests generally, and then also particularly in in the context of this protest. So that's that's sort of the 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 real concern. There are so many lessons from 2020. And in some ways what CPD has done is said, well, in 2020 there was a critique that we didn't have enough paperwork on use of force and arrests, so we're going to develop a policy that says in a mass arrest context our officers don't have to do detailed reports. They can just do, you know, minimal reporting and we'll be in line with policy. Um, so in some ways, they've taken some of the really, you know, deeply problematic things that happened during 2020 and said it's OK per CPD policy. Right. We're going to make the policy to condone the behavior. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, there there are is language in the policy that says things like the use of a baton strike to a head is a lethal force and shouldn't be done unless lethal force is authorized. There's also things in the policy that talk about officers can't retaliate against people who are um, speaking out against officers or, you know, using that there can be no retaliation. Those things were in policy in 2020, and they didn't provide any, you know, they just weren't operationalized in any real way. So again, I think it, it just is so telling about what CPD's plans are. Uh, for for the DNC, that this is sort of the the main policy change that they've really focused on. What you just shared. So, full disclosure, I, I went to the text. Um, and Dame, it's your favorite book. I think I saw the cover. It's Revolution Evolution. This is going to feel like a departure. I've been full disclosure. We're recording this in the midst of me in a in a feeling very long COVID quarantine, and so I've been reading in the midst of it. Feeling fine, listeners, don't worry. So we talk about Jimmy and Grace Lee Boggs a lot on the show. This is kind of their like canonical text, Revolution, Evolution in the 20th Century. And I'm finally getting to Chapter 7, Damon. You'll be very all excited. All right, all right. We're coming around. <laughs> but it, it basically, it talks about like how we became a nation centered around laws, which is actually really different from other cultures, other societies, other political structures. You know, emerging out of post-Reconstruction, the emergence of the importance of Jim Crow as a way of like, if those laws had to be definitive, then we had to prioritize the importance of laws, like that that had to be the defining structure of our society. And so, so they make the claim that the US became a nation with more laws than the rest of the world combined at that time, because they had to have two laws uh, for each law, basically. It makes the claim that like, in order to evade contradiction, air quotes, that's the law became the excuse to evade contradictions. So courts, lawyers, prisons, guards, and probation officers proliferate to service the prisoners being produced by the proliferating laws. So you build all of this infrastructure, all of this social infrastructure to protect the concept of the law as definitive. And the reason for that is to avoid having to face the contradictions within those laws. And so when you say like they built new policy, they built new laws to justify the contradictions in their behavior. Dame, this is why you've been telling me to finish the book is because it's very helpful. They have a little thing for anything. Does that ring true to you of this like, well, that's the law thing feeling? Where do you see that weaponized outside of the courtroom, basically? As a way to basically cloak 
systemic injustice. So I am going to talk about my favorite Supreme Court case that nobody ever knows about. It's this case called Bell v. Maryland. Jason Prez, uh, um, I know another friend of the, of the show, and I, we do this uh, legal fellowship for organizers, and we teach this case. Bellevue, M- Maryland happens in the context of the, the Black Freedom Movement. Baltimore, there's a sit-ins that are happening. And there are students who go into a, um, a, a restaurant in Baltimore. It's segregated, and they get kicked out. And they get told, they get criminally charged. Before they get kicked out, the um, owner of the restaurant asks them to leave, or the manager asks them to leave and says, you know, I really like Black folks. I would love to serve Black folks in my restaurant. Come to the kitchen. There's Black folks working in the kitchen. I treat them really nicely. The issue is that if we served Black folks here, no white people would come to the restaurant. So it's not me. It's, it's a business thing. Uh, and then the police end up showing up to the restaurant and say to the manager, if you want to charge these people, you got to go down to the police station, fill out an affidavit. He does it. They get criminally charged with trespass. While their cases are pending, the Maryland legislature passes a law, basically a public accommodations law, saying that it is against the law to, um, to not serve anyone on the basis of their race. Right. So so you cannot kick someone out of a restaurant because of the color of their skin. You can't stop somebody from getting on a train. Right. Public accommodations law. No more Jim Crow in in Maryland. So the protesters are now challenging their convictions for trespass based on the public accommodations law. And the case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, well, the public accommodations law doesn't address trespass. And these people were convicted under trespass. And when the, when, you know, the state of Maryland said you can't have segregation anymore, they never touched the trespass statute. So this is an issue for the Maryland courts to figure out whether or not the fact that now there's a public accommodations law and these uh, the sit-in, uh, the kids who are engaging in the sit-in were, were criminalized, you know, they got to deal with that. Then there is this amazing, amazing um, concurrence where the court there is saying essentially Jim Crow is a legacy of slavery. The fact that there were these laws directly tie into slavery. And when the state is using the criminal legal system to institutionalize social inequity, that's against the 14th Amendment. This is an issue of race. The majority that sent this back to the state courts was basically punting on the most important issue of our time. So first of all, I kind of say to my students, like, was the Supreme Court justice really an abolitionist? Like, is this the first abolitionist opinion from the Supreme Court? But it goes to your point, right, that that you sort of have, you have Jim Crow, which is institutionalized. You then have a law getting rid of Jim Crow. You have the criminal legal system operationalized to sort of make Jim Crow the law of the land. And then the fix doesn't quite get it there for the, you know, the people who are protesting because of the kind of legal technicalities. When it was their protest that brought about the new law in the first place. <laughs> exactly. Well, and so that's the other thing that one of the justices, I mean, the, the, the majority sort of says it doesn't make a lot of sense to assume that the Maryland legislature would want a public accommodations law to be passed and then allow for people to be criminalized by exercising their right. And then the other thing that the case says, it was sort of a novel issue of, of a crime became a right, right? This issue of like a, what was once a crime, right? And the crime was being a black person going into a white restaurant has now become a right. Right. It didn't just become decriminalized and quote, it became something that you have a active right to do. Right. And then I, um, the other thing that I do is, and this is like not my area of expertise, but then we also have like the Dobbs decision where now what was once a right is become a crime under, you know, because of all the criminalizing of abortion. But anyway, I mean, I think it's, it's a, I mean, I think the case tells us so much about, you know, what, how movement affects law and how, like, there is no such thing as law, right? Like law, (laughs) there really isn't. I mean, we sort of have the way it's interpreted. There's just institutionality. Exactly. I think that there's, there's so much there in terms of the limits of law and the power of movement in, in the history of that case. All right, listeners, if you want to sound smart at risk, 
of being obnoxious at a dinner party. Just pull B- Belle v. Maryland out your pocket. You got that equipped for you now. This little anecdote of... Slap that down on the table. <laughs> <laughs> With the first we abolitionist Supreme Court case. <laughs> there you go. This teaching you gave us is actually a good segue to something else we wanted to make sure that we we document and capture. Um, and that is your work as a law professor, particularly how that you know work leads you to teaching inside and you know the the history and lineage and tradition you're in of this like in-house kind of the production of what we call like the jailhouse lawyer but I feel like that term diminishes basically like this systemic freedom fighting that happens through navigating the legal process for folks who are incarcerated. So yeah, tell us about that work and how it differs in terms of your focus, your approach than the like representation of folks who, you know, are, are protesting on the ground or families or folks who have survived violence on the outside. Yeah, so um, I get to, I teach in the Northwestern Prison Education Project and I teach a class inside a maximum security prison called Abolition and the Law of Violence. Um, and in that class- How'd they let that in there? Isn't it? It's kind of amazing, isn't it? You know, I sometimes I wonder, like, are they really looking at this? Yeah, usually you got to come up with a way less hot title to be able to get away <laughs> with some shit like that, you know? Um, I, I Initially, I had, when I, when I first started teaching it in like 2017, I called it something like systemic change and violence reduction. And it really was a class on abolition. And then and then ultimately, we got to like what it is, which is abolition and, and you know, and the law of violence. And so we're we're comparing uh, the state response to intercommunal violence to the state response to state violence, and and really looking at sort of you know the the, the distinct responses. And law students take that class alongside uh, students who are incarcerated who are working on their bachelors at Northwestern. And teaching inside makes me a better human. It makes me a better lawyer. It makes me a better teacher. One, because the students in there are um, are so sharp. I mean, if I don't come correct, you know, if I don't know the footnote on page five of the reading, I, you know, I, get, I get called out respectfully and, you know, legitimately. But I mean, they really are, um, they, you know, they are, this stuff is not abstract for them, right? It's their lives. And so the way they engage with the material is just, you know, it's a teacher's dream. And then, you know, my law students who are at Northwestern, you know, who are, have, are high achievers, right? Have, you know, gone, you know, through like every single kind of test of their smarts and their discipline to get to Northwestern are then in a classroom with people, you know, who are incarcerated, some of whom have been incarcerated for most of their lives. And they're running circles around my law students in terms of their analysis, in terms of their rigor, and also in terms of their rejection of dogma, right? Their, their sort of willingness to have really hard conversations and they, their sort of the lack of fear of being perceived as, you know, politically correct is not the right answer. But I mean, like they want to get into it, right? And they, and they want to get, they want to use every single moment of their, um, of their time in the classroom. And that's the other thing that is, you know, that is humbling for me is to have a classroom, you know, of people who don't take for granted the privilege it is to learn. And, you know, and part of that is because, you know, in that classroom, you know, and they say, you know, my incarcerated students say this, like they feel like full actualized human beings. And it's the contrast between what happens in the classroom and the horrors out, you know, of their lives outside of the classroom. But that program um, is, is really a, um, it's changed me in, in so many ways. And I say that as somebody who before the program spent a lot of time in prison representing people who were incarcerated, but being in there in this way has, has, has really, has really changed me. And so my ultimate, my, I'm going to say this out loud, my, my sort of goal, my dream um, is to start a law school for people inside. Um, and that, that's sort of what I would really, I think is, I hope is the next step. Well, if you said it here, it's going to happen. The ergo bump is undefeated. It's good. <laughs> it's right. real and abstract. <laughs> we we have stamped it. It's it's coming. In in hearing that, you know, just to continue, y'all each had your your nerd moment. So I just want to bring in like in hearing that the the notion of pedagogy and like the Frarian approach to pedagogy and learning, and how it is not about the teacher imparting into or depositing knowledge into like a passive student subject, but that it is an interactive, reflexive process, and that the positionality of the student shapes the learning 
just as much, if not more, than the accreditation of the teacher or instructor, right? So, like, in just hearing that distinction, and like, shout out to your like, you know, law students, but like, in hearing the the distinction and approach, right? Like, a student who is incarcerated who has a higher probability of understanding the legal system holistically as an unjust structure of violence, as opposed to a legal student who may be coming to that system as one of like status or of norm or at least what's well, sometimes valor, but uh, but at least one that has the right to exist as it does. You're saying like people who are inside are way more likely to be like, this is an illegitimate system. System and students come going through law school are much more likely to say it's legitimate. That's a great way to not use as many words as I do. Thank you, Daniel. I'm trying to frary and nerd out. So I was trying to get, get my sentence flow going. But yeah, that's what I'm hearing is like the, the difference in that position and like the legitimacy of the structure then shifts how one interrogates the material of how it operates. Does that ring true, Sheila? Like, do you feel like there is a little bit, it's a little bit of a bigger leap for the Northwestern students to that, like this place, to to abolition of prisons? That this is something to question in the first place, as opposed to learn and and master. My answer is, is, I think, a bit nuanced. I have a number of incarcerated students who push back hard on the idea of abolition and who say every day I call home and I'm worried about the safety of my families. And I feel like, you know, what is, you know, why I feel okay about my grandson going to school is because, you know, there occasionally are cops, uh, you know, in, in, my, in my neighborhood. And so the, you know, the realities of living in neighborhoods that have been systemically divested, that have had to deal with the kind of intercommunal violence is often, you know, it's foreign to many of my law students. And so I, I think when that tension happens, when, I, when there is a law student who feels like they are down with the people and they are, you know, abolitionists and they even question whether or not there should be prison programming in prison because it's not that reformist, it's not liberatory. And then when they are confronted with somebody who is incarcerated, who's saying, you know, I don't know about abolition because how is my family going to keep be safe? I think, you know, those conversations are not infrequent and they're really generative and they happen from this baseline of, 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 I think both respect, but, but also, you know, those are, those are really serious questions. I'll say one of the moments, one of the classroom moments that sticks out to me the most was, was teaching inside the prison uh, during the trial of Jason Van Dyke um, for murdering Laquan McDonald. And in that class, um, you know, and the classes are different. And, and so in that class, most of the my incarcerated students identified as, as abolitionists. And then we had the conversation around, you know, well, what should happen to Jason Van Dyke? And the majority of people in the class said, well, he's got to go to prison. And then I had one student, William Peoples, who's published a lot and who's just an extraordinary, extraordinary human being, you know, said, well, then you're not an abolitionist, right? If we are going to be abolitionists, if we believe that the criminal legal system does not actually create more safety, we have to believe that for people that we despise. And I was just, and I was like, I, you know, I am exactly here being taught, right? I am, am, you know, that was, that was sort of, you know, so I feel like we have, these moments of real, real tension where people's both lived experience and then, you know, their, their, their willingness to engage with the material provides you know, both, both connections and also, you know, helps me think through some of the, the things that are sticky about, about wanting to do this work and, and really wanting to see a world without prisons in place. That kind of contradiction is the stuff that the law doesn't make room for, right? That it, is there to obscure. And I feel like we've been zooming in and zooming out in a real fun way. So I'm going to do one more zoom out. There is, I think, not a hand wringing, but like a collective discomfort in those moments, like the Jason Van Dyke verdict, which I think is really generative and useful and good. And I think the like the logics, the internalized logics of the law are so hard to escape in general. So what I'm thinking of, Kamala gets anointed uh, to take Biden's spot in the race. And, you know, you're already seeing she's a prosecutor. He's a felon. She knows how to handle people like him. Like that being the first language that people have from her backing. There are more important things than that being the center of the conversation. But I'm wondering for you, when you see these logics being used by people who are not like the full 100% opponents, right? These are not whatever positioning to mainstream liberalism and the Democratic Party, like there is a 
a, a difference in that like direct opponent, at least to me. I'm wondering, like, how do you hold how deeply policing and prisons live in our hearts and minds? Like we say that line of like policing lives in hearts and minds. How do you make it through watching that be how people make sense of the world all around you? Because for me, it's a challenge. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge challenge. And I and I think the moment that we're in right now with Kamala and the position that she's in, given the record that she's had, given the fact that she's made her career, you know, on being a prosecutor, right? Putting people in cages. That's why that's why she's in the position that she's in is really challenging given the realities of Donald Trump. I think it's important to hold the very real critique of of Harris's role, background, the positions she's taken, and also hold the reality of what a what a Trump presidency will mean. You know, and I'm going to say this for the rule of law, even though I think that you can, you know, <laughs> the rule of law is is not a real thing. But the rule of law under Trump is going to be very different than the rule of law under under Harris. And I think that, you know, that we can we can hold that. You know, as for the critiques of Donald Trump being a, a felon, I mean, that's that's just it, it's um, it's so unprincipled. And it also you know, just lacks a grounding in the world that we are trying to create. And it lacks a grounding in what it means to be a, a felon. Right. I mean, like, like that's an insult. Right. Some of the most brilliant, thoughtful, talented, achievement oriented people I know are also people with a felony conviction. So so it, it sort of like misses. Low key, it's it's rude to air quote felons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, he's an asshole. <laughs> yeah, right. No, that's right. It's like you think that's the insult, right? I mean, you know, and I'll say, I'll just talk about one of my other students, Bernard McKinley, who graduated from Northwestern while he was inside of Stateville, came out, volunteered for in my in my clinic with our students and is now going to be starting law school at Northwestern in the fall. There are some of my, some of my students who are innocent. He's not, right? He 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 when he was 16 years old, he committed a a, a violent crime. He's tried to spend every single day since then giving back to his community and healing the harm that he caused. And there are Northwestern alumni who don't think he belongs at Northwestern just because of his of his conviction. He's got, you know, much more support than he has detractors. But talk about another thing that, you know, that makes me angry, that the sort of that fuels my outrage. The idea that somebody like Bernard, who has ha- had to study and earn his bachelor's degree, exact same courses that a Northwestern college student would in Evanston, you know, in a correctional facility that is vermin infested, that has lead in the water, that is incredibly violent where he didn't always have, you know, where sometimes he had to give up the ability to talk to his family in order to complete his finals, right? This is somebody who is that determined. He got a score on his LSAT that qualifies him for admissions to, to Northwestern. He is, what he wants to do is open a legal clinic on the west side of Chicago. And the fact that he has the label felon, just because of that, people are going to be saying he doesn't belong. Now, of course, we know this happens all the time. You know, so when I think of that label, I think of people like, like Bernard, who, you know, I feel like, like when I get frustrated or when I feel tired, I think of Bernard. Right. Like I think of Bernard, you know, the work that he that he does. And, you know, Bernard keeps me going and keeps me centered. And so, you know, when I, I just think the the use of the label just ignores the reality, you know, ignores the reality of sort of the scope of mass imprisonment. Right. How many people have that label and also feels cheap and easy and unprincipled. So, you know, we were, we were talking a little bit about maybe some of the like contradictions within how Northwestern students versus folks are inside might be experiencing some of the same ideas and text. But, you know, we're, we're living in the, the months after a moment where I think so many students on campuses like experienced, if not like the full brunt, at least a, a performance of state violence as, you know, their solidarity encampment sprung up and then were dismantled between a combination of like co-optation, state force, political maneuvering, legal maneuvering. And so I'm wondering for you as a teacher of folks in both spaces, 
Was there anything that you learned from folks inside or folks that you've supported going through the legal process that you think was helpful for the students on campus confronting state violence in this way for maybe the first time for some of them? I feel like I was constantly drawing on the things I've learned from working with organizers and was constantly actually reaching out to to Jason um, Perez during that time. And, and sort of when students were asking me for for input, you know, when there was sort of tension between students, when they were negotiating with administration and and that sort of thing, really feeling like I was not helpful as a lawyer or even somebody as a negotiator. I was helpful because of the time I've spent in movement and what I've what I've learned, particularly around uh, the issues of conflict resolution and having processes and not sort of making assumptions about where people where people are. I'll, I'll say that, you know, the spring was a really intense time to be on a campus and to be, you know, one of the relatively few faculty member that students who were in the encampments who were unapologetically pro-Palestinian, you know, using the word genocide, you know, providing support for them was was important and it was an extension of the work and and also felt like we were, um, you know, that that we had to hold quite a, quite a bit. And and the other thing I'll say I felt was, you know, was really proud of the way that in their own ways they were willing to weaponize their privilege. And I feel like, you know, when my students, when my law students and my incarcerated students are working together or when my, you know, when my law students are asking for advice from my incarcerated students, it's always some, the answer is always some, some play on, you know, these law students have to weaponize their privilege to, you know, in, in some way. And, you know, that's what I felt like I saw. And then um, for the class I'm teaching um, inside this fall, I think it's like no mistake that a lot of the, a number of the law students that were involved um, in the encampment and in pro-Palestinian actions are taking my class this fall inside. So I feel like those connections are going to be made um, even more, even more powerful. So I can come back and tell you what those conversations were like. Sounds like a plan. And thanks for in the midst of what I, like you said, was a lot to hold. Just bringing the ethic of care to the young people on your campus and in your space. I'm I'm not surprised, but I am grateful. Yeah, let's let's continue to sum up in that gratitude. You know, I think I've named it in pieces throughout this conversation, but Sheila, just again, I want to thank you not only for like the support of me and my comrades, but my family through times of struggle, through times of grief, through times of loss. You've been a, a sturdy and, and stalwart presence, but the deeper gratitude is to how you extend yourself as a caretaker, as a dedicated mother to this, you know, indefinite formation that is movement, right? Like it, it continues to grow. It continues to expand and contract. Um, and since I've known you, you have been a constant among a sea of variables. And so thank you so much for continuing to show up and to bring your trade in the way that you do, but to go beyond being a lawyer and really being a nurturer and a freedom fighter with and for our people. So, so much love and, and thank you to you. Damon, you are going to make me cry. Do it. Let it out. Let it flow. You have to get it in before the. <laughs> no, I have to get ready to get on a call about the yeah. DNC. I have to like put on my my warrior. You know, I'm I'm so grateful for all of the work that both of you have done, and Damon, you and you and you in particular. And you know, I know, I know, and I believe, you know, as Miriam says, hope is a discipline. That my son is going to be in a better place because of you and your leadership. I know this, and the way you lead with love. How can folks find you and your work in the ways you would like to be found? I am on Twitter, Sheila A. Betty, or X, or whatever it is. No, we'll we'll, we'll say Twitter. <laughs> yeah, it's like a it's like a we still call it Comiskey situation. Yeah, right. <laughs> Big Sears Tower energy over here. Thank you so much for for being here. We're at Ergo Radio um, and at Respair Media. I'm at Ergo Kiss. I'm at Damon underscore F. And we'll be back reshaping culture for the more libertarian creative. Much love to the people. Peace.